All right, Russia has always been a mystery to the West. And it still is. You see, after the breakup of communism, the Soviet regime, people are busy saying Russia is finished. There are journal articles that appear frequently in very intellectual journals and in popular newspapers that seem to assume that Russia is over. Its birth rate is falling disastrously. It's poverty stricken. It seems to have no real sense of governance of itself. And so what is happening to Russia? We still sense that Russia is important to the destiny of the world and to Americans in particular. In fact, it seems almost like our other half because as a real nation, a modern nation, it was born about the same time America was. Now it goes back in ancient origins, but it came into world prominence at the time, about the same time that America did. And it's our shadow in a sense, because if Americans always have to be successful and have to win everything. Russians always have to lose. They feel committed to losing. <laughs> In fact, they say Russia is going to save the world through suffering. And so I want us to think about the Russian culture and the way in which that bears out that strange kind of calling that the Russians had to lose, to suffer, and yet to endure. Now our great source for understanding Russia is this brilliant flowering of Russian fiction in the mid-19th century. It's as great a literary renaissance as we have in any of recorded history. And it was in the novel. You see, if Greece, ancient Greece, archaic Greece gave us the epic. And as Suzanne Langer has said, the epic Homer's epic created Western civilization because the epic poems are world forming. But then we have the great Greek dramas of the fifth century Athens, which seem to have, you know, I think we could say created that worldview, that worldview that had within it Plato and Aristotle. And then we come on up to Shakespeare's dramas. Well, we skip Dante. See, Dante gave form to the whole Middle Ages and the coming Renaissance. And then we have Shakespeare and Milton and Melville. And so if Melville gave us some indication of the capacity of the novel with that great whale of a work that he wrote, the Russians gave us a whole arc beginning with Pushkin, Gogol, Turgenev, Dostoevsky at the mid-center, Tolstoy, Chekhov, Gorky, and then it's over. Now we had 20th century Russian writers, 
but they didn't work in the same cosmos that these men worked in. These men established an entire cosmos, a world. And it gives us an opportunity to see the way in which a lived way of life is reflected in great literature. So we don't just learn about Russian literature in studying this. It seems to me we're given the opportunity to see that connection between a culture and the poetic act, if by the poetic act we mean what Aristotle meant by it, that act of making a fiction. So that in a sense, a novel is a poem because it's a made thing. It's something with an organic form that is an image of the human lived at a particular time, but an image that somehow mysteriously gets at the universal. So that when we read Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov, we don't feel we're just reading about Russians. We're reading about human beings. We're reading about ourselves. So we have this brilliant flowering of Russian fiction in the mid-19th century, which give us a privileged view of that strange and mysterious people. There's a new book that some of you may wish to read. You can get it on Amazon. It's by Orlando Figes, F-I-G-E-S. And it's called Nastasha's Dance. And he takes up in it all of the highlights that I had been gathering over these years, thinking that they were significant um, in revealing to us something about the Russian character. And Fijis, who teaches at the University of London, has published this book, which is very, very fine, and you may wish to read it. It's very readable and interesting. But he tries to get at the Russian character. And he says of these novels that they are huge poetic structures for symbolic contemplation. They're not just novels. They're huge poetic structures for symbolic contemplation. The novels of Gogol and Turgenev, and particularly Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, he says, are not unlike icons. I had already developed before I read this my, my theory that Dostoevsky in particular, in particular uh, uses a kind of iconic method in his portraiture, in his novels. So he says these novels are not unlike icons. And then he, <laughs> then he ruins it by going ahead and saying, or laboratories. <laughs> in which to test ideas and live with the characters, as in a science or religion. So these artists then were animated, he says, for the search for truths as science were, as theologians have been, as philosophers have been. And that is what it seems to me that we have to see about these novels, is that they are a mode of truth. And that means they have universal qualities. But we get at those universal qualities only through seeing all of the local, particular, specific aspects of them, because they are vast analogies. And if we simply read them without being aware of the Russian culture that they express, we miss a great deal of them. 
Finn just points out the overarching subject of all these novels was Russia. Its character, its history, its customs and conventions, its spiritual essence, and its destiny. And I think you'll see as we read these works how much these writers are concerned with the destiny of Russia. And Fee just says, in a way that was extraordinary, if not unique to Russia, the country's artistic energy was almost wholly given to the quest to grasp the idea of the nationality. What did it mean to be a Russian? What was Russia's place and mission in the world? And where was the true Russia? In Europe or in Asia? These were the accursed questions, he says, that occupied the mind of every serious writer, literary critic, and historian, painter, and composer, theologian, and philosopher in the golden age of Russian culture from Pushkin to Pasternak. And this is the early 19th century to the early 20th. So Fridge's book, Nastasha's Dance, is based on a passage in Tolstoy's War and Peace in which an aristocratic young lady faced with a Russian celebration suddenly joins in the dance and executes a typically Russian folk dance that she couldn't have known. She couldn't have been acquainted with it because the split between the aristocracy after Peter the Great was so huge that the aristocracy lived in a world that spoke French and German and the peasants continued the lowly Russian and remembered all the customs and the dances and songs and tales. But this young lady, Nastasha, suddenly breaks into a typical Russian folk dance. Where did it come from? It was in her blood. She was Russian. And so it is with the culture of these strange and remarkable people. Chuchev, a 19th century Slavophile. Now, in the 19th century, intellectuals were divided into the Slavophiles and the Westernizers. And so I think, again, this is something we can learn, the terrible effect that Western civilization has had on the world and yet the glorious effect that it's had. And so we can study as though we're looking at a, in a laboratory at the effect of modernity on a settled people. And so the Slavophiles are the ones who do not wish to give up any of the aspects of old Russia and the westernizers are the ones who want to go along with all the changes that Peter the Great brought into Russia, and they want Russia to be European. And so this was a very bitter debate in the 19th century during the time that your authors were writing. And so Chuchev was a Slavophile, and he declared that it was impossible to understand his country if you weren't Russian. You can only believe in Russia, he said. You can't understand it. And Dostoevsky once said that no nation has ever managed quite so successfully to hide its real nature from the rest of the world. But the headlines of a recent article in the Atlantic Monthly blared out, Russia is finished. In some particular way, here in the 21st century, after the collapse of the power system, broken and impoverished and fragmented, radioactive, beset by criminals, its birth rate rapidly diminishing, Russia is more alive and more important to us than ever. So before we begin our study of the high point of Russian awareness, these novels, 
I want today to go over some of the elements of Russian culture that have entered into the shaping of the Russian soul. And now this is the only time that we'll talk about Russian backgrounds and Russian history and all of that. But because these novels embody so much of this culture that is alien to us, you see, because it's our dark side, it's our other side. It's something that never occurs to us. You know, those of us who are part of this culture of success. So it seems that we need to, briefly at least, to look at some of the aspects of the Russian background. So we have to consider, first of all, the Russian religious mind. There are many authorities that say if there's one thing we need to understand about Russia, it's that it is religious. Now, I don't know what we say about it now, you know, in this strange new millennium <coughs> that we've entered. But we can say, along with many commentators, that along with this religion, this yearning for God, went a very great agnosticism. And so it's as though we have a balance between the two, a passionate balance. But as we say, Russia's kind of Christianity is different from that that we are acquainted with. Russia's Christianity is kenotic, K-E-N-O-T-I-C, which is, comes from the word kenosis, which means self-emptying. It's based on a passage in scripture when it says that God emptied himself to become man. And so the Russian interpretation of Christianity was that one must empty oneself and give and suffer. Now, one of the points we have to note is the way in which Christianity came to Russia. The story of the early Russians' embrace of Christianity is told in its most ancient historical document, the Yapatev Chronicle. And we're told a story about Vladimir of Kiev, the Prince of Kiev. And Kiev was a very highly developed society about the time of Beowulf. It was a warrior culture and noble and aristocratic and had communications with <coughs> Europe. It was not cut off at all. So it was not before, not until the Mongol invasion uh, in the 14th century that Russia became backward because as I was telling one of you before class, 90% of the Russian people were made serfs under the Mongols when they were conquered. But until that time, it had been an aristocratic society, a warrior society like the Anglo-Saxons. And so Vladimir or we are more likely to say Vladimir, uh, was the prince of Kiev. And he decided that it was time for his people to have a formal religion. And so he sent envoys to the great religions of the world. And when they came back, he had them report to him what they found. And the ones who came back from Islam saying that those who embraced the Muslim faith were not allowed to drink alcohol. Vladimir immediately said, well, that's not for us. <laughs> <laughs> and the ones who came back from Jerusalem were likewise dismissed after, describing, after declaring that the God of this faith dispersed his people uh, all over the world so that they had no land of their own. 
and Vladimir said, that's not for us. But the ones who came back from Constantinople, having seen that Hagia Sophia had a different story, they said, we know not what people believe in that faith, but when we entered into their house of worship, everything was so beautiful that we knew not whether we were on earth or in heaven. And Vladimir said, that's the one for us. So the choice was made not on articles of faith, but on the beauty of that gorgeous Hagia Sophia. And you might compare that now. I don't know whether you're familiar with the story of how Christianity came to England, you know, but it was um, a, the little anecdote that is preserved is that um, King Edmund had his wise men beside him, his Witan, and two Christian missionaries had come in. He wants to know whether to listen to them or not. And one of the wise men says, oh, King, the life of man is like the life of a sparrow. He flies into the meat hall, out of the dark and the cold and the ice. And for a brief time, he's in a lighted hall where there's music and song and wine and food and merriment. But he flies on through and flies out the other window into the dark and the cold and the ice and the snow. Such, O oh King, is the life of man as our faith teaches it. And so if these have anything more to say than that, I suggest that we hear them. And so Christianity came to England then on the basis of hope, on the basis of the fact that it offered more hope to human beings than the pagan Norse religion. But it came to Russia on the basis of beauty. It didn't matter, they said, what they believed. Their worship, their place of worship was so beautiful. We didn't know whether we were on earth or in heaven. So I think we remember that uh, because the Russian religion kept that kind of character. And then it developed what I have called its kenotic quality. Christianity had a powerful effect on these noble pagans. Many wealthy converts gave away their fortunes. They took seriously the New Testament teachings, you know, and they didn't think they should own property. They became martyrs, willingly, the first saints or Boris and Gleb, who stood with no resistance and allowed themselves to be cut to pieces by the bloodthirsty mob led by their brother, who sought to have no rivals to the throne. So among them, there developed then the, the character of the Eurodivy, Y-U-R-O-D-I-V-Y. I'm going to write people, words on the board. That word I spoke of, kenosis, which is that self-emptying quality. And then the eurodivi, which means holy fool. So the love of beauty, which is iconic, The canonic quality of humility and the foolishness, the willingness to be as a little child, which we characterized the Russian religion. And above all, there developed the particularly Russian icon introduced into Slavic territories by the Greek Orthodox Church but gradually modified, taking on the character of the Russian soul. And then the Russian concept of Sobornost, which was a pagan quality, S-O-B-O-R-N-O-S-T, which if we translated literally, 
togetherness. So it's the unity, S-O-B-O-R-N-O-S-T. It's the unity of the Russian people. They didn't think of themselves, they were not individualistic, in other words. They had a familial relationship, and you'll find among the peasants that so many of them call each other uncle or brother you know, or auntie or whatever, but it's a, it's a concept of togetherness. And of course, when that was secularized, you know, it, it could easily become communism, which didn't work out to be what they thought it would be. But we can, you, you might want to read sometime of uh, the most famous Russian philosopher, Berdyaev, B-E-R-D-Y-A-E-V, Nikolai Berdyaev, who was exiled from Russia after the revolution. But he wrote several books on uh, the Russian mind, the origins of communism, such works as that. So they were aware then, when they became Christian, that this subornost was the mystical body of Christ. Now we have no such sense of belonging to each other in the West. We sometimes pretend we do. But we have, we've been pretty individualistic all along. Individualism has always been an important issue for us. As J.B. Priestley, a British writer, has written, if liberty has always been the ideal of the English and equality has been the ideal of the American, then brotherhood has been the secret dream of the Russian. So liberty above everything for the British equality, apparently, above everything for Americans, and brotherhood for Russians. Now, another element distinguishing the Russian soul is the deep love of the earth. Apparently, the ancient religion of the Russians that we don't know much about uh, was a worship of the earth. And that was incorporated into their Christianity. So that more than any other Christian nation, the Russians kept aspects of their paganism, baptized them, so to say, so that I think you'll see woman is looked at differently in these novels from the way she's been regarded in the West. And their name for Mary is Theotokos, Mother of God. Whereas we tend in the West to call her the Blessed Virgin. So they blended in a way that authorities are quite satisfied is not pagan. They blended that love of the earth and its blessings with the transcendent love of the divine and with the suffering of Christ. So when you see in these novels, and particularly in Dostoevsky, you see someone bowing down and kissing the earth. You see, that's an ancient, ancient custom. And it's a custom of wholeness. Because they thought of heaven as this earth transformed. So I think you see they missed the platonic element in the West. They never became angelic and separated from the earth. Incarnation is what they emphasize more than the resurrection, even. Now, we've spoken of their peculiar kind of tendency to suffer and to lose 
And one of their documents, one of their early documents that was written about the same time as the Beowulf manuscript is the Lay of the Host of Igor. It's a 12th century epic poem. And it's about a campaign of a prince named Igor <coughs> who lived in Kiev during the time of the warrior culture. And the story uh, is of this hot-headed prince who goes out to conquer the Polovatsian folk who are invading uh, across that flat steppes that led into Kiev. There were always invasions from the east. And it was not time, it was not proper, it was not a good time for Prince Igor to make this uh, raid that he made. And we don't know why, but all the elders advise him not to do it. But he can't restrain himself. And so Prince Igor rides out, and all nature warns him as he goes. Nature, the, the river, the, the birds, the leaves, everything uh, seems to warn him not to go. But he goes on, and he makes this raid with his men, and he's captured. And during the time that he's captured, his wife, the be beautiful Yaroslavna, comes down to the river and, as she says, dips her sleeve of beaver, she's wearing fur, in the river. And she prays to all the elements, to the sun, you know, to the sky, to the water. And she speaks to them, really, as though she's a goddess. She doesn't just plead. In a way, she commands them, you know, to get her husband home to her. Now, there is no comparable uh, epic like that. Uh, if you think about Beowulf, you see what a small role a woman has. She can pass the mead cup around, and that's about all, you know, <laughs> pass the cookies. But, <laughs> but here we have this regal, beautiful woman who sings, who prays to the sun and the moon and the sky and all the elements, and they obey her, apparently, because it's at that moment that Prince Igor gets the idea to escape. God put it into Prince Igor's mind, we're told in the poem, to escape. And so he escapes, and he makes it home, and all of nature helps him, the little uh, animals keep quiet so that no one will know he's passing by, and the water uh, wafts him gently. Nature sympathizes with him. He gets home. The people greet him as though he is a returning, conquering hero. But look how strange that is. He lost. He was captured. His raid failed. And yet Prince Igor was hailed, you know, as a returning, victorious prince. So it seems to me, though no one else has pointed this out about it, but it seems to me that this is so characteristic of the Russian mind that they love and worship someone who tries something magnificent and fails. Now, we're going to see in these novels that we're reading a figure that's called, a 19th century figure that's called the superfluous man. You won't see him until you get to Turgenev. The Dostoevsky is full of him. The person that looks like a hero, that leads other people, but leads them to defeat and disaster. He's a loser, and yet he's admired. And so I think we have to notice all of this in this fiction that we are reading. And there are other elements that I think tell us something about these strange people that are like our other half. 
So they are part of Western civilization. But it was their occupation by the Mongols, which was an influence in the shaping of the Russian character. <coughs> Without this invasion, Russia might have developed much as did Sweden, Germany, and England. But soon after the introduction of Christianity, an invasion by the grandson of Genghis Khan effectively destroyed the high civilization of Kiev and occupied the Russian soil for two solid centuries. Now the story is told that these powerful Mongol troops planning to sweep through Russia, conquering everything on their way to Europe, envisioned a stunning victory and they thought they would get into Europe and conquer a great deal of Europe. But they found that though they could conquer the Russians, they could not leave them behind. See, once you've conquered them, what do you do with them? The unruly Russians, even though reduced to serfdom, could not be subdued sufficiently to allow their conquerors to turn their backs on them. Now, as they were to do in Moscow, with Napoleon, and in 1943 in Stalingrad with the Nazi armies, these sturdy Russians made use of a scorched earth policy, leaving nothing for their conquerors to utilize, even though it reduced them to absolute poverty. You see, they were not able to be conquered, and so the Mongols could not leave the Russians behind because they would have risen up again. So Russia has thus proved virtually impossible to conquer on her own soil. But the Mongols occupied Russia for two centuries, 200 years, and that put them back, of course, into a position of inferiority. It gave them the mentality of slaves. and it left an irreparable mark on the national character. Now, during this time, the center of the nation was moved from Kiev to Moscow. When the Mongols invaded the lands of the Kievan Rus, Moscow was an insignificant trading outpost. But then it became the center of this medieval Russia and one of the powerful princes, calling himself Caesar, Tsar, as he became the first Tsar, and had automatically all of the power centered in him. Now there was a great deal of folk literature that developed underground while all of this was going on and these people were conquered just as we saw with the American slaves, there were folk tales and songs, and the spirit couldn't be kept uh, down. So there was folk literature that developed with the Russians. And I just want to tell you one of the stories just so you'll see the kind of wry quality that it has. One of them is called The Judgment of Shimyaka. It seems to me a delightful demonstration of the sympathy for the underdog that characterized the Russian mind. And the story is of a rich brother and a poor brother. This is characteristic of so much of their folk literature. So a rich brother lends a poor brother his horse. The poor brother begs him long enough that finally the rich brother lends him his horse. But he doesn't lend him a harness. So the poor brother can't make the horse run. And in trying to, he pulls the horse's tail off. The rich brother is indignant and furious, and he says, I'm going to sue you for this. And so they start out to the village to sue. On the way, they stop at a parson's home, and the rich brother is fed, and the poor brother leans out of his upper bunk to watch the others eat, and he falls on the parson's child and kills him. <laughs> 
Now, this is the kind of humor they have in these tales. <laughs> it's black humor. And the parson says, I'm going to sue you for that. <laughs> so, so they all, the, all of them start out for the village to, to sue. And on the way, the poor brother tries to commit suicide because he doesn't see what he can do because he has no money, he can't pay anything. So he gets up on a high bridge and jumps off. But he falls on a man's father and kills him. <laughs> and so the man says, I'm going to sue you. <laughs> And so they all come finally before a judge. And all the plaintiffs bribe the judge. And the poor man has nothing to bribe him with, so he, he wraps a rock in his handkerchief and brandishes it, you see, as though it's a lump of gold. And the judge notices it. And so the judge then finds these, these verdicts finally. To the rich brother, he says, your brother must return your horse in the same condition in which you lent it. And therefore, he must keep the horse until it grows a new tail. <laughs> so you see, the poor man gets to keep the horse. Then in the second one, he says, since this man killed one of your children, he must provide you with a child. So he'll have to engender one on your wife. <laughs> <laughs> And then to the third man, he says, since this man killed your father by jumping off the bridge, you must kill him by jumping off that high bridge. <laughs> so of course the three men don't want to do any of these things. And so the poor brother wins. And so when the judge sends somebody to collect his bride, the poor man shows him the rock that he had wrapped up in his handkerchief. And he says, it's a good thing he found for me or I would have killed him. And when they, the emissary goes back to the judge, the judge says, oh, I certainly am glad that I decided for him or he would have killed me. So, <laughs> so that's, that's the kind of humor that those folk tales had, which is pretty dark, but pretty resilient, I think you must agree. So we find here the shrewd wisdom concerning the way of the world that has characterized the Russian peasant throughout all the times of hardship. But now the thing that really changed Russia was Peter the Great and his westernization, which took place in the 18th century. Now what time is it? All right, you can look a while longer. Now Peter was called the enlightened despot. He went to Europe and studied in Germany, and studied in France, and in England. He was seven feet tall. He worked in the shipyards, incognito. People didn't know it was the Tsar of Russia. So he came back to Russia with all of the European knowledge, and he ordered that beards be cut off. He did some very violent things, like killing all of the uh, palace guards and all that, but the thing that caused the most stir of all was his ordering that beards be cut off. And the peasants wouldn't do it. The ar aristocrats did, but the peasants would not cut their beards off, no matter how many of them he killed. And so the beard became the mark of the peasant. Peter set up a jury system. He changed the church. He reformed education. He established conscription into the army. The segregation of men and women outside the home. Drinking and smoking came in with his reign. And he established a soul tax that applied even to the dead serf. Now, when you read Gogol's Dead Souls, you'll see how much this applies. Because that book is about a kind of scam in which a salesman goes through the countryside buying up dead souls. Because he wants to rent some land, and he has to have a certain number of serfs 
in order to qualify for the government loan. And the owners are glad to get rid of their dead souls because they're having to pay taxes on them. So it was because Peter had instituted a soul tax that included those that died that Gogol could write that satire, Dead Soul. <coughs> now that book is more than a satire. It's a strange, grotesque kind of work that anticipates Flannery O'Connor and uh, weird writers in the 20th century. So, uh, so don't, don't think of it just as a satire, but give yourself over to the strange, grotesque world that it is. So Peter, the, the thing that was most startling that Peter did was to build a city out of a swamp. See, we, this sounds familiar to us. We, we knew a city that was below sea level, didn't we? And it flooded. And so the poem that I'm going to have you read at the break is about a flood of this city that Peter built, St. Petersburg, that became the symbol for the new Russia, the new capital of St. Petersburg. He called it a window upon the Baltic. He knocked down a tiny Finnish village on marshy land to build his new city. He had fantastic expenditures. All the buildings were of brick, and stone, he had no wood. Architects and builders and stonemasons conscripted for the job. 10 years it took to build this complete city and hundreds of thousands of workers died in the process. So they, they moved the, the capital of Russia from Moscow to St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg then became the emblem of modernity and it was admired and deplored. These writers, particularly Dostoevsky, show you how fantastic they think St. Petersburg is. They don't think it's a normal city, you see. And so the poem that you're going to read um, after the break, The Bronze Horseman, is about this city of Peters which flooded. Now, Orlando Figes, in his book, Nastasha's Dance, says, swept by thick mists from melting snow in spring and overblown by winds that often caused the rivers to rise above the land, it was not a place for human habitation. Wolves and bears were its only residents. In four months of furious activity, in which at least half the workforce died, 20,000 conscripts built the Peter and Paul Fortress. See, that's a place for Peter uh, to live. Digging out the land with their bare hands, dragging logs and stones and carrying them by back and carrying the earth in the folds of their clothes. We're told that the spectacular task of moving such massive amounts of stone has been surpassed only by the building of the pyramids in Egypt. So that city was torn violently out of marshy land. A city should not have been there, but it was put there by the will of one man. Every piece of metal, every stone had to be imported. Thousands of workers died in the process. It became the symbol of the artificial city as opposed to Moscow, which had taken on the character of the holy city, the center of Russian orthodoxy. So Peter changed everything in Russia. He was like the Reformation. He was like the scientific revolution because he brought in from Germany science. He brought in from France literature. He brought in the French and German languages so that upper-class Russians no longer knew Russian. 
Pushkin was the first to start this magnificent movement that we're studying this evening. Pushkin wrote in Russian, though he was an aristocrat. He learned Russian from his old nursemaid, a serf. And so to have him write in Russian, you see, was a real breakthrough. So the Russians think of Pushkin as the great writer of this whole movement. But when we read him, they think of him as the Shakespeare of Russian literature. When we read him, he seems to us more like the Byron, you know, because he, he was writing at the time of Lord Byron, and his writing was a great deal like Byron's. And it was good, but it was not to us at all what it has been to the Russians. Now, we are not studying him. You're going to read his poem uh, after the break, but we're not studying him in this class because he didn't write a novel. This is, of course, in the Russian novel. See, he wrote poems, but he was tremendously important. He was part black. He was the grandson of Hannibal, the serf, the black slave of um, one of the czars, who was treated very handsomely and given land and became an aristocrat. And so Pushkin was uh, considered an aristocrat, but he was part black. He was killed in a duel over his wife's honor, died when he was very young. And Russia grieved for him uh, excessively. Now the westernizing process that Peter brought into his country divided the Russian people. Before that time, the aristocrats and the common people had spoken the same language. They worshipped in the same way. They believed the same things. And after Peter, as one authority has said, the soul of Russia was cleft in two so that the aristocrats were forever separated from the peasants. So a poem written by Pushkin called The Bronze Horseman became a symbol in the eyes of the Slavophiles, those who held to the ways of ancient Russia. It's about the gigantic equestrian statue of Peter the Great on Senate Square, just outside the gates of St. Petersburg. The front hooves of a horse paw the air as it faces toward Europe, and its back hooves tread on the snake that represents Russian backwardness and ignorance. And so that became a symbol to these Russian thinkers, and I think you'll see in this poem that you're going to read um, how they felt about it. Because one poor government clerk decides to defy it and shake his fist at it. And so um, I'll leave that to you to, to read. But now the turning point for the Russians was the defeat of Napoleon. Russia was to defeat the great hero Napoleon in a decisive victory at Moscow in 1812. So everything was leading toward this high point when these writers would be given uh, a way of seeing what Russia was meant to be. They had this victory over Napoleon. The manuscript of the Lay of the Host of Igor was discovered about this time, which gave them a vision of the heroic. They had Pushkin, who had begun writing literary things in Russian, and so they met together and knew each other and made a movement in literature, though they were divided into the Slavophiles and the Westernizers. There grew up a literary criticism in Russia that was extremely intelligent and demanded of writers that they meet certain standards. Mostly that literary criticism was leftist. You had to be have socialist leanings in order to get by 
with the critics. And you had to have very conservative leanings to get by with the czar. So think of the heroic aspect of these writers' lives, that they would dare write at all. Because if they didn't please the critics, their works didn't succeed, and they couldn't go on with their careers. If they didn't please the czar and his officers, they might be led to the execution squad, as Dostoevsky was. See, when we get to Dostoevsky, we'll have to go over that part of his life, but he was sentenced to death. And that sentence was commuted to 10 years hard labor in Siberia. So it took tremendous courage for these men to write. Does literature do best when it's confronting a time of danger? Is everything too easy for us now in this 21st century? For the writer, too many grants, you know, too much of the easy life, too much publicity, all of that, I don't know. But at any rate, we realize that these writers were extremely brave in writing at all. So the high point of Russian creativity then is the 19th century, from 1812 to the Marxist revolution in 1917. The energy that animated these artistic accomplishments was much like the creative energy of Athens that gave rise to the Greek Golden Age or the High Middle Ages to the European Renaissance. In this amazing 19th century, we have the writers Karamzin, Pushkin, Gogol, Lermontov, Goncharov, Turgenev, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Chekhov, and Gorky, to name only the most famous. Now, in music, there was Glinka and Tchaikovsky and Rimsky-Korsakov and Diaghilev, Stravinsky and Rachmaninoff. And then the 20th century writers and artists, you know, in this winding down, Akhmatova, Nabokov, Pasternak, Meyerhold, Eisenstein, Shostakovich, Mandelstam, Solzhenitsyn. So it's an enormous list of creative geniuses and the height of them all, I think we can say, is this body of material that we are studying in this class. There are, uh, these are artists that belong to the world. You know, they're not limited simply to their provincial habitus, but they express that culture. And perhaps the great artists always do. We have to think about that. Dostoevsky said, is purported to have said, we all came out from under Gogol's overcoat because Gogol wrote a short story called The Overcoat. And Dostoevsky thought it was a new note in the world, and that all of this Russian fiction came out from under Gogol's overcoat. Now let me tell you a little bit about Gogol. You'll be reading Dead Souls next time, but let's talk a moment in the time we have left about his story, The Overcoat. He was a strange and gifted Ukrainian writer who settled in Petersburg and more than any one artist established in his Petersburg tales, the image of that city as unreal, phantasmic, alienating, as Dostoevsky was later to say, fantastic. Petersburg was a fantastic city. Gogol's short story, The Overcoat, is justly famous. In it, a government clerk named Akaki Akakievich, and that's supposed to be comic in Russian itself, because it's supposed to sound a little bit like um, excrement, as it does in English, Akaki Akakievich. Uh, he's a copier, like our typists used to be, 
like our computer operators are perhaps now. He's a small, somewhat pockmarked, <coughs> with hair somewhat reddish, and his eyes look somewhat blind. He uses somewhat about it, everything so that you realize he's, he's neither one thing or another. And he lives only for his copying. His world is made up of letters of the alphabet. He finds that his overcoat, which has been a long-standing shield against the fiercely cold Petersburg winters, is full of holes. Now this is a crisis because you have to have an overcoat in the winter in Petersburg. You must know that a Kaki Akakievich overcoat served as an object of ridicule to the officials. They even deprived it of the noble name of overcoat and called it a capota, a cape. A Kaki Akakievich says to the tailor, here, you see, everywhere in different places, it's quite strong. It's a little dusty and looks old, but it's new. Only here in one place, it's a little yeah, on the back. And here on one of the shoulders, it's a little worn. Yes. Here on the shoulder, it's a little, do you see? This is all and a little work. Petrovich took the overcoat, spread it out to begin with on the table looked long at it, shook his head, put out his hand to the windowsill after his snuff box, adorned with the portrait of some general. Having taken a pinch of snuff, Petrovich spread the overcoat out on his hands and inspected it against the light and again shook his head. Then he turned, Lining up, turned it lining upwards and shook his head once more and having stuffed his nose with snuff, covered and put away the snuff box, said finally, no, it's impossible to mend it. It's a miserable garment. Akaki Akakovich's heart sank at these words. Why is it impossible, Petrovich, he said, almost in the pleading voice of a child. All that ails it is that it's worn on the shoulders. You must have some pieces. Yes, patches could be found. Patches are easily found, said Petrovich. But there's nothing to sew them to. The thing is completely rotten. If you touch a needle to it, it will give way. Well, let it give way, and you can put on another patch at once. But there's nothing to put the patches on. It's very far gone. It's lucky that it's cloth. For if the wind were to blow, it would fly away. We'll strengthen it again. No, said Petrovich decisively. There's nothing to be done with it. It's a thoroughly bad job. You'd better, when the cold we weather comes on, make yourself some foot bandages out of it, because stockings are not warm. The Germans invented foot bandages in order to make more money, he says. Petrovich loved to poke fun at the Germans. But it's plain that you must have a new overcoat. At the word new, all grew dark before Akaki Akakovich's eyes, and everything in the room began to twirl around. How a new one, said he, as if still in a dream. Well, I have no money for that. Yes, a new one, said Petrovich, with barbarous composure. <laughs> you would have to lay out a hundred and fifty or more, said Petrovich, and pursed up his lips significantly. He greatly liked powerful effects, liked to stun utterly and suddenly, and then to glance sidewise to see what face the, the stricken person would put on the matter. A hundred and fifty rubles for an overcoat shrieked Poor Akaki Akakievich shrieked, perhaps for the first time in his life, for his voice had always been distinguished for its softness. <laughs> Akaki Akakievich finally acknowledges that he must have a new coat. But how is he to manage? He already barely gets by on his small wage as a titular counselor, but he finds that by eating a meal only every other day, 
and by not using candles at home when he takes his work home to copy, but copying in the dark, he can manage to save enough to pay for the overcoat. And he finds himself dreaming of the new coat. It takes on the lineaments of something loved, say, like a wife. The long and the short of it is that the tailor finally finishes it, and the cocky finally is able to pay him, and he goes to an office party that very evening, and they all admire him, and he has the time of his life. In his joy, he drinks too much, and on his way home, he's set upon by robbers, and his coat is taken from him. He goes to the law courts. I'm summarizing. This is not in uh, Gogol's language. He goes to the law courts the very next day and is told that the matter will be looked into. It continues that way for a week with his reporting each day and each day being put off. He decides to appeal to an important official. This is a man whose ordinary converse with his inferiors smacked of sternness and consisted chiefly of three phrases. How dare you? That's one of them. You, do you know who you're talking to? And the third one is, do you realize who stands before you? Still, Akaki Akakovich approaches the official. To this prominent personage, our Akaki Akakovich presented himself, and that at the most unfavorable time, very inopportune for himself, though opportune for the prominent personage. The prominent personage was in the, in the other room, conversing very, very gaily with a recently arrived old acquaintance and companion of his childhood, whom he had not seen for several years. He refuses to see Akaki Akakovich, and after a long wait, he finally agrees to see him. On perceiving Akaki Akakovich's modest mien and his worn uniform, he turns abruptly to him and says, what do you want? In a curt, hard voice, which he had practiced in his room in private <laughs> and before the looking glass for a week before receiving his present rank. Akaki Akakovich, who already felt betimes the proper amount of fear, became somewhat confused. And as well as he could, as well as his tongue would permit, he explained with a rather more frequent addition than usual of the word that, that his overcoat was quite new, that it had been stolen in the most inhuman manner, that he had applied to him, that in order that he might in some way by his intermediation, that he might enter into correspondence with the chief superintendent of police and find the coat. The important personage roars at him, and poor Akaki is petrified with fright. He goes home, catches cold, falls ill, and within a week, dies. They sealed up neither his room nor his effects because there was very little inheritance, namely a bunch of goose quills, a choir of white official paper, three pairs of socks, two or three buttons which had burst off his trousers, and the cape already known to the reader. They carried Akaki Akakovich out and buried him, and Petersburg was left without Akaki Akakovich, as though he had never lived there. A being disappeared and was hidden, who was protected by none, dear to none, interesting to none, who never even attracted to himself the attention of an ab observer of nature, who omits no opportunity of thrusting a pin through a common fly and examine it under the microscope. He didn't even attract the attention of someone who did things like that. A being who bore meekly the jibes of the department and went to his grave without having done one unusual deed. But a fantastic turn was taken by this history. First of all, Justice compels us to say that after the departure of poor, thoroughly annihilated Akaki Akakovich, the important personage felt something like remorse. Suffering was unpleasant to him. 
his heart was accessible to many good impulses, in spite of the fact that he had rank very often his rank very often prevented his showing it. He finds out that Akaki Akakovich has died, and he was startled. He listened to the reproaches of his conscience, and he was out of sorts for the whole day. Now this important personage decides to cheer himself up by calling on his mistress and wrapping himself luxuriously in his coat, found himself in that delightful position than which a Russian can conceive nothing better, which is when he thinks of nothing. Fully cheered, he recalled all the pleasant points of the evening just passed and all the clever remarks which had made the small circle laugh. Many of them he repeated now in a low voice and found them quite as funny as before. And therefore it's not surprising that he should laugh heartily at them. Occasionally though, however, he was hindered by gusts of wind, which coming <coughs> suddenly God knows whence or why, cut his face, flinging in it lumps of snow, filling out his coat collar like a sail, or suddenly blowing it over his head with supernatural force, and thus causing him constant trouble to disentangle himself. Suddenly the important personage felt someone clutch him very firmly by the collar, and turning around, he perceived a man of short stature in an old worn uniform and recognized, not without terror, Akaki Akakevich. The official's face was white as snow and looked just like a corpse's. But his horror transcended all bounds when he saw the dead man's mouth open and with the terrible odor of the grave utter the following remarks. Ah, uh, here you are at last. I have you by the collar. I need your coat. You took no trouble about mine, but reprimanded me. Now give up your own. The pallid, prominent personage almost died, brave as he was in the office and in the presence of inferiors generally. And although at the sight of his manly form and appearance, everyone would say, how much character he has. Yet at this moment, he, like many possessed of an heroic exterior, experienced such terror that not without cause, he began to fear an attack of illness. He flung his coat hastily from his shoulders and shouted to his coachman in an unnatural voice, home at full speed. The coachman, hearing the tone, which is generally employed at critical moments and even accompanied by something much more tangible, drew his head down between his shoulders in case of an emergency, flourished his snout and flew on like an arrow. In a little more than six minutes, the prominent personage was off the entrance of his own house. Pale, thoroughly scared and coatless, he went home and said to Karolina Ivanovna's, got to his chamber after some fashion and passed the night in the direst distress. So that the next morning, over their tea, his daughter said plainly, you're very pale today, Papa. But Papa remained silent and said not a word to anyone of what had happened to him, where he had been, or where he had intended to go. This occurrence made a deep impression on him. He even began to say less frequently to his under officials, how dare you? Do you realize who stands before you? But the most noteworthy part was that from that day, the apparition of the dead official ceased to be seen. So the ghost is not seen anymore. Evidently, the general's overcoat quite fitted his shoulders. At all events, no more instances of dragging overcoats from people's shoulders were heard of. 
but many active and apprehensive persons could by no means reassure themselves and asserted that the dead official still showed himself in distant parts of the city. And in fact, one watchman in Kolomna saw with his own eyes the apparition come from behind a house, but being rather weak of body, so much so that once upon a time an ordinary full-grown pig running out of a private house knocked him off his legs, to the great amusement of the surrounding public coachman from whom he demanded a, a grouch and a piece for snuff as damages. So that kind of, that kind of um, a detour is characteristic of Ch um, um, Gogo. Being weak, he dared not arrest him, but followed him in the dark until at length the apparition looked around, paused, and inquired, what do you want? and showed such a fist as you never see on living men. And the watchman said, it's all of no consequence, and turned back instantly, but the apparition was much too tall, with huge mustaches, and directing its steps apparently toward the Abukov Bridge, disappeared in the darkness of the night. Now what Gogol does there, of course, is to taper off with this gossip you see, because the real apparition that appeared and took the overcoat from the public official disappeared after he got his overcoat. But talk in the town, you know, thinks it sees this uh, ghost again several times, and Gogo, in a gossipy kind of tone, tells you about it. So this is characteristic of Gogol's writing, <laughs> which you either develop a taste for or you, or you don't. But um, I think you can see, and you will see when you read Dead Souls, uh, the marvelous kind of strange and weird humor that he has. So G Gogol makes clear in this grotesque, darkly comic manner the cold, oppressive, heartless modern city where people prey upon each other, the bureaucratic office, the miserable work of a copier in an office, the inefficiency and uncaringness of the law, the cruelty of officialdom, the way in which language can be debased into cliches and shows that amidst all that injustice, there's a kind of supernatural cosmic justice. He extended the dimensions of prose fiction, not in the way that Edgar Allan Poe did, by taking us into a scary world, but by introducing the frighteningly strange and uncanny into this ordinary world. So these elements were to enter into a great body of subsequent Russian writing. We all came out from under Gogol overcoat. Well, now I have a few concluding remarks I want to say after the break, but I want you now to uh, take a break for 15 minutes and then come back and we will divide you into four groups and you will read to each other the Pushkin poem and discuss it. I think there's time to get it read and to discuss it and then we'll come back together after that. So come back in here after 15 minutes. I think you've seen something of the ambiguity in the Russian attitude toward the achievement of Peter and toward St. Petersburg. But now this is a poem, a narrative poem, and the great genius of these writers is to be manifested in the novel. In fact, I think we might feel almost that they have defined the scope of the novel for us. And the novel is going to be a tremendously important form in postmodernity. So instead of the novels being limited 
as in the European novels, the continental novels and, and English novels. Instead of its being limited just to the drawing room and the moral problems, Gogol is going to introduce us to metaphysical problems, and Dostoevsky will take him up on that. Now, the content of this material is important because it's going to show us, it's going to give us a way to see the impact of modernity on a settled traditional society. The impact of Europe upon a different kind of society. And we're seeing that go on all over the world today. <coughs> the impact of America on traditional folk societies. Is it possible, as Solzhenitsyn said when he was in prison, is it possible for one nation to learn from another? He said he thought it was. And so by our reading these novels, we are enlightened about questions such as terrorism. We're going to see the origins of terrorism in Dostoevsky. <coughs> But chiefly, we're going to see the enlargement of the novel's scope. Now, when I say scope, what I mean is the dimensions of the novel. See, there's going to be all the dimensions that we have in Dante. We're going to have an underworld. We're going to have an upper world, a celestial region, as well as a dark abyss. It's not going to be just a picture of social issues as it has, as the novel has become in Europe and a great deal of America. So this, though it may seem in this first lecture that, uh, that this is a study primarily of Russian culture, it's really a study of the novel. And we are aware, after we've finished reading these works, of the potentiality within the novel, not only to reflect cultural issues, but to make a difference to them. So read, taking in, I'm not going to thank you. <laughs> taking in details as you go, and not in them, but read rapidly. Because if you read rapidly enough, as I say, you will awaken uh, an aspect of yourself that uh, ordinary reading doesn't do. Now, when you reduce everything to the rational and simply study it closely uh, and go into it liberally and figuratively and all that, but you stop the motion, then something doesn't happen to you that ought to happen in narrative. So try it.